All right, hey guys, what's going on? So today we're going to be talking about generators of SU2, where this is sort of setting the foundation of all the things we're going to be talking about. So I'm not going to get too much into the weeds into this introduction. Again, if you like this kind of content, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Now let's get into it. So today we are talking about generators for SU2. So let's let's start right so typically what you're taught in a lot of textbooks or in courses is that the poly matrices are SU2 matrices and that's true right the they they are unitary matrices and their determinant is 1 right so that that's what the s means right so the s oops the s means special the u means unitary we know what unitary matrices are. Hopefully you have at least a little bit of, of an understanding of what they are. And then we know that the S refers to all of those unitary matrices in which their determinant is one. Okay. Let's, so we've sort of been taught that the Pauli exclusion, that the Pauli matrices are uh, unitary matrices. Let's see now that these Pauli matrices are a little bit more than just that, right? They act as generators for rotations. Let's take a look at how this works. So here we're gonna, here's our first Pauli matrix, uh, sigma one. And we've defined calculating gener the calculating the generators as being the derivative of a matrix or the derivative of a rotation matrix with respect to the argument in that matrix, right? So here, the argument here is theta. That's the angle of rotation again. And this is your typical rotation matrix, right? So uh, this is a rotation matrix around the origin, right? So if you, if you can picture, uh, if you can picture a graph and a, a vector, we're rotating that vector, right? And that is, that mathematically that rotation is encapsulated in um, in this matrix where theta again is the angle that subtends right there. So there's theta. Let so if we take the derivative and then we set theta equal to zero again. This is how we defined the um, the generator. Uh, we so taking the derivative of cosines minus sine. Uh, negative sine is minus cosine, uh, sine is cosine, uh, derivative of cosine is negative sine. Then we set um, theta equal to zero, so that when theta equals zero, right, we are here. Okay. And what that means is you, what you're sort of thinking of this as like the initial push of the vector rotation, right? And uh, what we get is this. So this matrix, right? This matrix, this matrix right here is the generator, the thing that initially pushes. You can think of that. Uh, initially initiates or pushes this rotation. That's why it's. You could think it. That's why you can think of it as somewhat of a generator, right? Because something that generates something that is something that initiates something. Okay. Genesis, right? The the the, the entomology of the word is right there as well. Uh, anyways, the uh, sigma two matrix. So the second Pauli matrix is one that looks like this. Now, so we have these eyes now, right? These eyes, well, these eyes don't really change anything, right? Because uh, this is just in the complex plane. Uh, the eyes don't change the derivative though, right? Because. Oh, uh, Something got erased, it looks like. I'll just redraw that. That should be cosine. Uh, this is just in the complex plane, right? So uh, we, uh, so this sigma here, then we have uh, equals zero, equals zero. So we put zero into here and we get this. All right, so this is our second Pauli matrix. So one is a rotation in real space. The other one is a ro rotation in complex space. Then we have sigma three, 
right? So sigma three, what's interesting about sigma three is that this is what our matrix looks like. And this is actually a rotation matrix, right? You can, it's just that we've taken sine here, and we've taken, right, we, we've taken their signs here, and we've kind of put them all into one entry, right? We've taken the signs, and we've put them all into one entry. And what's interesting about this is that you can take the derivative of this, and what you'll find is that the derivative of this is actually uh, one, right? Because you do this times this minus this times this. Well, th this times this, well, that's just going to be cosine squared. This plus and the minus are going to get rid of those two uh, intermediate terms, and then we're going to get cosine squared uh, plus sine squared, right? Because we're going to have a uh, minus sign times negative one, because we're going to get that i times i is negative one, so that's going to be plus, and we're going to get uh, sine squared. So the de the derivative or the determinant of this matrix is one, which is very interesting to think about, right? Um, and, and this is also this is a very this is a, a rotation matrix, the same rotation matrix that looks like this. However, when we take the derivative, right, we get this, then we set theta equal to zero, well, we get somewhat of a different looking generator. And that looks like this guy right here. This is, this cannot, this generator cannot be made up of any, uh, it cannot be made up of any linear terms in these two guys, right, because they're just in the wrong entries, right? So there's no way that you can build this guy from these two guys. So these are all linearly independent matrices, and they are the generators of SU2, okay? So we found that we can rotate 2D vectors uh, in this way, and in this sense, I is a generator for 2D rotations, right? So, but we also found that when we put SU2 matrices in quaternions, we double covered SO3 transformations. That's something we talked about earlier. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that, in this sense, the SU2 transformations were more fundamental than SO3 because, again, the SU2 matrices double covered SO3. And so let's take a look um, here that they, they, they also seem to obey the commutation relationship with SO3. What that means is that you take sigma 1, sigma 2, you do all this matrix multiplication, and you get something that's very similar to the uh, SO3 matrices where the sigma 3 comes out here. Right, so this is sigma 3. And uh, so we get something that looks very similar. The way we can get it to make it even look look even more similar is if we multiply both sides by 1 half, right? Multiply bo both sides by 1 half, we get rid of this 2. And then we just make everything general, right? So this will become an I, this becomes a J, and this becomes a K. And we get something that looks like this. So this is our SU2 algebra. And this here is our, SO th is our SO3 Lie algebra. Look how, how similar those things are. That's worth thinking about, right? So the, the algebra for these SU2 matrices, or these SU2 generators, the algebra for them, is the same exact algebra for uh, the SO3 matrices. And the, so this is a little bit interesting, right? The generators of SO3 and SU2 have the same Lie algebra. So we might be inclined to think that they are sort of one and the same thing. One might be uh, a representation of the other. They have this thing in common, which is the Lie algebra. However, one is one set of matrices is two-dimensional, right? It's two by two. However, the other one is a three by three matrix. So what what gives here, right? So the question becomes, well, if one's a two by two matrix, what kind of vectors or vector-like objects are, are, are those guys operating on? And if the other one's a three by three matrix, what kind of vectors are those guys operating on? And that's where the language of spinners and vectors sort of come into play, right? We think now that the represent that they are different representations. That they're, they're sort of one and the same thing. One is just a different representation of the other in a lower dimension. 
that's some that's a way of thinking about this one's a different representation of the other in a lower dimension what we're going to find very interestingly is that we can have what we're what we're going to have is we're going to have Lorentz transformations being represented in different dimensions right so a Lorentz transformation say in space-time is going to be a four by four it's going to be represented by a four by four matrix however a um we could have a different representation of that Lorentz transformation operating in two-dimensional space, right? And those are going to be uh, spinners, right? Right chiral spinners and left chiral spinners. So this is sort of how we want to start thinking about things, right? What are the different representations of the transformations that we're dealing with? And then further on down the line, we're going to find out SO th SU3, Generators play a role in interactions. Um, and yeah, so this is a bit before, I, I won't get too ahead of myself, but um, this is the problem again that we run into. SU, SO3 matrices act on 3D coordinates of uh, some vector. If SU2 matrices double cover 3D coordinate transformations, do SU2 matrices act on three coordinates of a vector? Well, no, because one is three dimensional, the other one's two by two. So you can't multiply those two. That'd be by like multiplying apples and oranges together. You just can't do that. So these are only, they're only 2D, they're only 2D matrices. So this inclines us to think that uh, spinners or two dimensional objects are representations of the things that are getting transformed, say, in 3D or 4D space. All right, so we're going to, this is how this is all going to get played out. And what we're going to get into within the next few videos is how do we sort of mathematically denote these representations, and then we're going to get into the Lorentz transformations, how we, uh, and how we sort of mathematically label uh, the different representations for Lorentz transformations. And then we're going to get into um, how we can go from a fundamentally a mathematical theory or a mathematical um, uh, a mathematical description of Lagrangians for using these matrices, using the language of these matrices, right? So we're going to ask, what is the U1 representation for uh, some Lagrangian? And we're going to find out that the, I would not, uh, so we're going to find out that for U1, we're going to get, scalar Lagrangians for U2, we're going to get Lagrangians, uh, we're going to get sp uh, spinner Lagrangians, right, so that's a direct Lagrangian, and for, um, and we're, we're just going to keep on going from there, I don't want to uh, divert too much into, uh, but I kind of do want to get you excited, because this is a very, very exciting area of physics, it's very, very new, this is what particle physics is predicated on, and this is what's going to be uh, the rest of our life for the next uh, however many so videos we're going to be talking about. And then hopefully later on down the line, we'll talk about, you know, SU5 representations, right? So SU5 representations, again, that gets us into representation theory on um, uh, uh, GUT, you know, grand unified theories. Uh, or theories of everything, right? So the toe the theory of everything. This is something you've heard in Kurt Jaimungle's podcast, right? So he is a guy who talks about, I believe he's a physicist, and um, or he at least studied some physics. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but this, uh, the SU5 generators, they sort of touch the the field of, of toes, right? So the, 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 the theories of everything. And we, uh, and then from there, we're maybe we'll, maybe we'll get into twisters, right? So Roger Penrose's work on twisters, but that that's far on down the line. I do want to get your your feet wet on this because this is all of this is definitely going to come up, and this is um, this is a very very fun and lively area of of, of physics interest. String theory also is going to uh, is going to get introduced here, but um, yeah. With that being said. I hope you guys really like this kind of content and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.